Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Tom Secker, welcome back to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you, as always, for coming to uh, to chat with us. Yeah, no worries, man. Thanks for having me back. And uh, I think this case, that we, this story, this this whole series of events that we're going to be looking at today. I, I mean, I was I kind of suggested this to you in part because of this documentary series called Leavenworth, which is where I not first learned about the Clinton Rants case and all of the stuff around it, but it really helped me piece a lot of things together and provoked a lot of questions. And so I think this story is a kind of a, a, a cynic dose in some way, a microcosm of the whole war in Afghanistan experience in terms of the, the confluence of, of factors that led to what happened and then everything that happened afterwards. And so, yeah, it's a, a fascinating story that I think anyone who doesn't already know about should know about and the people who have already heard about this hopefully they'll learn something and and we'll be able to get into some of the questions they have about this today so um in terms of us discussing the the documentary today everything that we're discussing is stuff that you can find in in written media as well but if Listeners, if you do have the chance to take the time and watch the documentary series, I think it's about uh, six episodes long. Um, it's it's very worth it. There's a, there's a lot of really good stuff that they bring up, both about the war in Afghanistan and about the the grind and the nature of soldiers going through a situation like this. Um, so our uh, of course we're going to be talking about uh, Clint Lawrence and Clint Lawrence. Uh, he, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on his background prior to joining the military. I don't know that it's terribly relevant. He was born in Hobart, Oklahoma. Um, he lived in a lot of different places as a kid. Uh, his family now lives in uh, Celeste, Texas. Um, but just to, you know, just, just to start it off in terms of, of how much he wanted to do this, wanted to have this kind of career, um, Lawrence joined the Army as an enlisted MP, just like myself. Um, on his 18th birthday in 2002, oddly enough, also the same year I joined the Army, um, he ended up doing 24 months in South Korea, working as a, a patrolman and a traffic officer, basic, you know, being at the base, writing people tickets, all the, the normal stuff that MPs do uh, back in uh, back on, on bases. Um, he then, then did a 15-month tour in Iraq, um, guarding detainees. Um, he left the enlisted army shortly after that to uh, work on getting his bachelor's degree from the University of North Texas, and he received a commission through ROTC as a second lieutenant uh, in the uh, infantry branch. So he then moves to uh, North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and starts doing his basic lieutenant uh, tasks and courses and things, goes to airborne school. And in 2011, he deploys with the 4th Brigade Combat Team, um, 82nd Airborne Division, to Afghanistan. So from there, we jump up to just a few days before the main course of incidents that happened with, with Lawrence. In the days leading up to Lawrence taking over the platoon that he ultimately leads for those three days, that platoon had sustained four casualties. Uh, among those wounded was 
Lawrence's predecessor, the, the, the platoon leader, the lieutenant who was leading their platoon. He suffered uh, shot and wounds to his abdomen, his limbs, his eyes, and his face when a hidden IED improvised explosive device went off. So his squadron, um, Lawrence's squadron, where they, they had had him working as a liaison officer for the squadron or battalion, if, if you're more familiar with that term, they're just different names for the same thing. But he was working in an operations center going over intelligence. That was one of his jobs is that he would read through and try to dissect some of the intelligence as it was coming in. And that will play a bit of a role later on in the story. Now, it's important that we pause right here for just a second to talk about Afghanistan at the actual time. Um, it was in the height of the Obama surge. There were 100,000 plus troops in Afghanistan, and it was a very bloody and hard time for U.S. troops in terms of, of the overall war. The other things to mention before we get into a, a little bit more is that it's important to note that um, second lieutenants come to units with sometimes with very little, if any, real life experience on being a leader or even being in the army. Uh, Lawrence seem, seemed to have a little bit of a bump on that, given that he spent years as a as an enlisted soldier. I think he was a E6, a staff sergeant, when he ended up um, going to college. Um, but one of the most important things is that when a new lieutenant, when a brand new lieutenant comes to a unit, they are usually taken kind of under the wing of the platoon sergeant, the, the senior non-commissioned officer in that particular unit. And it is on their lead that new platoon leaders, new lieutenants kind of get their feet wet a little bit. But there, there's a lot to learn, a lot to understand. Um, and this will all be a little more clear when we talk, uh, talk about a little bit later, as well as discussing why it is so inherently dangerous that Lawrence refused the advice and counsel of his, uh, his unit sergeants. So... Lawrence gets to his platoon, and again, we have, they just had four uh, four casualties, I'm saying in the last two months prior to him getting there. And immediately when he hits the ground running, things are rocky from the start. Um, starting on the 30th of June, 2012, uh, this three days we're discussing, um, Lawrence threatened to kill an Afghan man and his family. Uh, the man who was a, a farmer and his child, about four years old, were at the gate to their camp talking to the Americans about the concertina wire that was blocking access to his farm field. Concertina wire is something that soldiers use a lot. We use it to block roads. We can create little temporary prisoner of war stations to hold people, but it, it's very common and people asking you to move it is a very common thing. Lawrence's response was, quote, you move the C wire, concertina wire, I'll have somebody kill you according to a specialist who, who witnessed it. Um, he then tried to suggest to the Afghan that he should turn in found IEDs, found roadside bombs into the Americans. Um, quote, he was like, you bring us IEDs or we'll have the ANA, the Afghanistan National Army, kill your family. And he also said, well, if we ever come onto your land and step on an IED or find an IED, I'm going to have the ANA come and kill your family. Do you want to see your child grow up? So this, this was really indicative of his attitude arriving at the unit. And, um, you know, he wasn't, he, I don't, I don't think he was nasty or bad to any of the actual soldiers, but he didn't really listen to them at all. He didn't really attempt to, to take in any of their advice or, demonstrate that he was in a new place and that he needed to follow along with what was happening, especially given that he was an enlisted soldier before he became an officer. Then we move to the next day. Uh, Lawrence directed one of the platoon's squad designated marksmen, which is a fancy term for a, a basic sniper, guys who have M14s and, and provide coverage for soldiers and um Lawrence told one of them to fire his rifle um, into the neighboring village and specifically said to shoot near groups of people as well as at walls and vehicles. 
Um, and then at one point, one of the soldiers refused to shoot when Lawrence directed him to fire near a group of children. Um, and he kept telling them that, that he wanted, that it was a, it was a great idea. We're going to scare these guys. So they actually attend our Shura and we won't lose any more guys. Now, Shura is, uh, Afghan, uh, in Afghanistan when they have a, an elders meeting, a village elders meeting, and that is where they all sit down and discuss what's been happening in the community. So for some fucked up reason, Lawrence thought that by threatening them, he was going to entice them to come and speak to him, that if they believed that their deaths were imminent, that they would be more likely to come and help out. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, in some ways, is the craziest thing in this whole story. It, it, I mean, it's not the worst thing, morally speaking or legally speaking, but in terms of, like, Lawrence's mentality when he got yeah. dropped into this, yeah. I mean, I very much get the impression this was a guy who didn't know what he was walking into and wasn't prepared for it, not to excuse what he did, but, like, I think this guy was out of his depth, quite honestly. Well, it doesn't even sound like he gave a shit. Like, he didn't seem to care of what anybody else said. And he wanted to do what he wanted to do because he wanted to prove himself as an officer more than just, like, is this the right thing to do or is this actually going to help the mission? But, yeah, the notion that people who you've ordered someone to shoot at are then going to go, oh, yeah, this guy obviously just wants to have a peaceful chat about something. Let's go to the meeting on Friday morning and Perfect. go and ask why he's shooting at us. What, what on earth was going through his head? Yeah. You know? I don't, yeah. I, I, I know that there was, there's, um, he wanted to create a situation where what he thought would be, would be the best to prevent more injuries. And that, it's been demonstrated that the more the more people that we end up hurting on the other side of a conflict, and especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, the more people are brought to their side. More people are, are told that the Americans, you know, that that we have no no viability to be there. Um, so, Lawrence later, after this this pot shop thing happened, um, he tried to have a sergeant who was working. In, the, in his old operations center um, to report that they have received, received incoming pot shots, that, the, that they had been coming out on patrol or fired up at the guard tower. Um, that, uh, quote, he told me to report it up that they had taken pot shots from the village. I told him uh, that I wouldn't because it's, it's a false report. Um, the sergeant also said that, Lorenz said, quote, he didn't really care about upsetting them too much because he fucking hated them. Um, and so I, I think in, in addition to what you guys mentioned, I think that, you know, he, he really came into this with a, a very specific mental agenda in terms of what the enemy was. And then you see all these other people, all these other, you know, other leaders, his commander, all the other soldiers, they're like, this is literally going to get more people killed. Do you not understand that? And I think his, whatever sense of hatred or loathing he had overrode that um, because this, this is somebody that would have been, you know, he, he was by all measures, a good soldier before he became a Lieutenant. He did what he was supposed to do. He didn't get in any trouble. Um, and then, and then we come to, we come to this and it seems like that he personalized the hatred much more than, than you ever should. So we come to uh, the next day, which is is uh, is the, the the climax of this of this story. Um, the soldiers prepared to head out on a patrol, and at that time, a small group of three or four Afghan men met them at the gate. They were very upset and wanted to know why the Americans had shot into their village the day before. Um, Lawrence told them that if they have a problem, they could attend the shura. Um, that he planned to have later in the week, and the Afghans refused to budge. Uh, quote, he told them to get out of there, um, so Private Skelton said in his testimony. Quote, he started very aggressively yelling at them and started counting, and then he pulled back the charging handle on his weapon and chambered around. And the interpreter 
panicked right there the guy you know who's who's the the, the link between the soldiers and and their community there sees this and just and just freaks out um and the guys the other african guys were there they just they ended up turning and leaving so the squad um of americans and alongside a squad of afghan national army soldiers start out on a, a patrol a daily patrol and they said just moments into the patrol uh, some of the soldiers weren't even past the main gate of the camp yet um lawrence ordered uh one of the the gunners in the group because they had a a gun truck that was doing overwatch for them a little ways back and they were high enough up that they could see a little bit that the other guys couldn't see um a couple guys pull up within visual range of their gate on a motorcycle but they are like 600 meters away they are a considerable distance from anybody and he tells his soldier to to fire on them and the soldier was trying to get it across to Lorance that at this point there was no type of threat against them they weren't coming at us um i remember him asking why isn't anybody firing yet and then Lorance literally took the radio out of the soldier's hand and told the gun truck to open fire and so the gunner fires after hearing you know there were different people arguing trying to tell him to stop where Lorance was telling him to fire um the two of the excuse me there were three guys two of them died immediately and the third ran away so the patrol moves out into the village where the bodies are quickly surrounded by crying and upset villagers so here's here's where it's get, it gets even worse so Lawrence prevented the the platoon's battle damage assessment soldier which uh, a battle damage assessment or bda involves uh taking biometric and personal data of off of of suspected fighters um and instead Laurent sent two other soldiers who aren't trained in the same way that first soldier was to search the bodies um and the one that they had the one that was supposed to do it he was the only one that had the actual equipment they have these specialized little computers that allow them to collect fingerprints and collect a dna sample and i don't know how scientific it is but at the very least they did have procedures for it then later, he falsely reported to his troop commander, Lawrence, that he was unable to conduct a battle damage assessment because the bodies had already been removed. Those dead men were still laying there on the ground, but he lied to his commander and said that they couldn't do what they do every time somebody gets shot or they find a dead body and do this battle damage assessment. Um, a former team leader for the platoon said he believed that the three men on the motorcycle were the same who came to the gate the day beforehand to talk to the soldiers on the road and the soldiers are just beside themselves you know quote we weren't anywhere in near the road where these guys were coming they weren't speeding towards troops they didn't have any kind of actual threat um and then another soldier upon walking up on the men recognized one of them and quote, we had been in that village so many times, we knew right then and there that these were the village elders. These are the guys that actually matter in the village and we just killed them, end quote. Uh -huh. And the identities of the men who died remain remains in dispute to this day. I, I, not so much by me, but in terms of some of the media covering this, some of the soldiers say that day that at least one of the vill village elders was killed um, or Lawrence's lawyer argued that the prosecution never named the men in court or in the charging documents against his client. I mean, well, my understanding of the two people who were killed is that they were a father and son. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yes, that, that certainly the father was in some way a village elder, a respected man in the village um, and a perfectly ordinary person. I mean, one of Lawrence's lawyers... We, we should make clear, Lawrence went on trial with one lawyer, was found guilty, uh, sentenced, ended up in Leavenworth. He then got another lawyer or even set of lawyers who have been attempting various appeals and, and things, and eventually he was pardoned by Trump. Um, his second lawyer, the one who was very much trying to challenge what the army had done and challenge the army's case, 
dug up some information that at least one of these men who'd been killed had in some way been tied to bomb making materials or bomb components but it was all kind of like okay they they supposedly found the same fingerprint but it wasn't clear whether this was on a box containing bomb components or on the components themselves and it's like there's a hundred different ways that could actually happen without this guy being a bomb builder for heaven's sake i mean all you've really got there is some kind of fingerprint connection to something that may or may not be relevant and of course did they say what those components were uh that was never made clear in any of the <laughs> stuff i read to be honest no, no, no. so you know what i mean this could just be some wiring or something exactly in, 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 there's, and so what if it was something more suspicious than wiring the guy might have just had a box of stuff in his house for a couple of days and that's how his fingerprint ends up on it he might not actually have anything to do with making bombs so the notion that this guy was part of the insurgency is tenuous at best and regardless in that moment they weren't doing anything like that. Yeah, they didn't have any no weapons. Threat. They didn't have any bombs. They weren't posing this this platoon any kind of threat at all. They were stationary on a motorbike. That's about as innocent as you can get in rural Afghanistan, isn't it? So and like way far away from them too. Yeah, yeah like six hundred. <laughs> no, I um, I recently finished a book called First Platoon, which is half about Lawrence's story and then half about the the biometric half of this and and that was the that was the genesis of Lawrence's pardon one of the things that they they put across in the media the most times was that here are these guys that can be found in a um American military biometric system that says that they are sp suspected bomb makers but within that system they don't do anything to distill down like what you guys are mentioning exactly what what where was this bomb residue found you know was it on this person's hands uh, are there any other mitigating factors such as that the taliban sometimes puts them down inside farmers fields and they actually show them how to disarm it and that way that if they have to do something there they actually can do it or their family can pass but they have to set it back up because if it's not set up the way that they want then they can't go after American troops. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of guesswork in that, but the, the biggest thing, and the court ruled on that none of this evidence could be admitted because at the time that Lawrence told his soldiers to fire, this information wasn't available to them. They weren't mm -hmm. known bomb makers when they said to pull the trigger. You can't go you know it can't be bad guys after the fact in that way what was you know what was the reasoning for it what was the threat against your troops or to civilians in the village you know they have we have to be able to articulate that and mm -hmm. even even if today that it could be proven 100 percent that those guys were in fact taliban bomb makers lawrence didn't know that so mm -hmm. his actions can't be seen through that that particular lens but glad, uh, very glad you brought that uh, brought that up tom well, and just on that point, because this is something they go back and forth with in the documentary, and I, there's a lot of ambiguities about this, but I always keep coming back to the point that I still believe that what Lawrence did was wrong, regardless of all the other elements of this, some of which we'll get into. But I do think there is an argument to be made that that evidence should have at least been presented during the trial so that this argument could be done, so that, you know, uh, the defense could say, oh, but we, we've sort of found some evidence that they might be linked to bomb making. And they, you know, the counter argument is, yeah, but you didn't know that at the time. It has no bearing on what Rant did and what he ordered people to do. And ultimately, that evidence is pretty vague and tenuous at best anyway. And I think a jury should actually be able to hear that argument and, and make their decision on that basis. I do feel that excluding it entirely from the trial was dodgy, was questionable. Um, maybe you disagree. I'm just offering my opinion here as a non-lawyer and someone who's never been through a court martial. So, if the if the prosecutors knew about it and didn't disclose it, I would I would absolutely agree with you. the The ruling that they made about the evidence when they were trying to get Lawrence an appeal, um, 
the judges specifically pointed out that they were not going to, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, they were not going to push the prosecutors to have to search in, you know, the vast um, databases of, of DOD for every little shred of evidence that they could find that might be related to it. Um, and so, and, and I'm, I'm guessing that the, the information is probably classified as well. You know, what, what, whether or not it's actually accurate or tells us what we need to know about the people, the information is collected, it's still behind a wall in there somewhere. Um, but I do agree with you in terms of the, of the media presentation of this and the overall case that um, I think that, that it, sh it should have been discussed, but I do agree that for Lawrence's purpose, it's, it's, it is it's very much not a question. I mean, it, 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 um, it is kind of a non secretary, isn't it? It is. Yeah. This, it, this it, is some other information that you didn't know at the time. So therefore had no bearing on your decision. Yeah. Um, and also is, is something to point out here and I'll, I'll talk about it a little more later is that the, almost all the soldiers in Lawrence's platoon testified against him. They testified mm -hmm. for the prosecution. Now, there were a few of them that did receive immunity for their prosecution, but several testified who didn't receive immunity. And some of those, you know, there were some other charges aside from Lawrence's related to this against the NCOs in his platoon that they did not act as forcefully as they could have in trying to stop him. Now, that's, I, I, that's not really a question I want to get into today, but that that was... Um, I, I believe part of the reason that they ended up getting those offers uh, of immunity was, was to do that. But after looking at the whole thing and studying it for some time, it's definitely on him. It's definitely on Lawrence. Um, mm. And there's some more, more lying coming up that I don't think I've gotten to yet. I might have already said it. but So um, one of the former NCOs in the platoon said that the platoon is a group as a as as a cohesive group of, of people of soldiers that they never recovered from what happened on july 2nd the date that the, the shooting happened quote we were family and he split our family up we have gone through so much shit because of this dude we didn't ask for this we didn't want this he wanted to see contact meaning he wanted to to be mm -hmm. in a firefight he wanted to be out there and he fucked up and he should pay for it. Um, another soldier said that, quote, I, I, uh, I feel like he was out for blood. Uh, th you know, three days prior, prior to the incident, a soldier from our platoon got shot in the neck. I felt like he went in there and wanted to prove to us that he wanted to take care of us. And that, that's all well and good, but that's, that's entirely fails to acknowledge the situation that they were in, the, the unique status of American forces in Afghanistan, trying to demonstrate to the people that they're on their side, trying to establish some amount of trust so that it, it actually feels like you, you have some kind of backing from the people, but that requires a lot of work and a lot of trust. And these kind of things just throw it out. And soldiers know that. They know that these things happen and people will stop trusting them. And not just the people in Afghanistan, but people in their unit that they start getting, you know, not not specific documented reprisals, but people coming up to them saying, you know, why didn't you fucking back your lieutenant? You know, that they that there were other people in the unit who found it to be a matter of loyalty and saw them as disloyal more than anything else. It was I mean, and, and there were lots of other leaders who didn't, but it, it's clear that there was um, that some of Lawrence's feelings were definitely reciprocated. Um, in that way. It just made me sad when I was reading some of the articles you sent about like the guy who had committed suicide recently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, they had said, by all accounts, he was like a good, happy dude and he had a good life. And so everybody in the unit had thought he was doing okay. But uh, there was a quote in there that I really liked where they said that they didn't know that behind closed doors, he was at times verbally abusive, ashamed of his inner torment, and like so many of them, unable to articulate his pain. And I was just like, God damn it, if that doesn't describe like 99% of post-9-11 vets, I don't know what does. 
No, absolutely. It's uh, and, and I'm, I, I actually included their names in here and and what their status is. We'll get to a, in a in a little bit. Um, but it it was it was you know an absolute shit show of a situation inside an already shit show of a war, and it's hard enough coming home as it is, even without something this horrifying. You know that even if they Lawrence had never came all the deaths and injuries to the guys in their platoon, you know, that's a lot to carry. It's a lot to, and, and um, especially like for the NCOs here, you know, looking back on it, you know, not acting um, meant not protecting their other troops. You know, I don't think they saw it that way. I'm not, I'm not just throwing that in their faces, but that by allowing the situation to go as it did, it put their troops and themselves in a really, really horrible spot. Hence one of the reasons why leaders end up harping so much on the rules of, of whatever situation, in this case, the rules of engagement for the, for the actual theater, you know, they, they want to, if at all possible, minimize the guilt that their guys bring home. You know, I don't think all leaders are that way. I don't think all leaders care that much, but some certainly do. And, and Hmm. this, this should be one of those situations where, they see that 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 loyalty is not so cut and dry, um, and that within the service, those those really um, some really bad things can happen to people. So that evening, after they got back to their camp, um, Lawrence's soldiers uh, turned him in. There was there was, you know, with his situations of asking them to lie and not allowing him to do the battle damage assessment, which is something they do all the time that they had been doing for months and months before Lawrence uh, arrived. Um, and at his trial in 2013, 14 of the platoon members testified against him. Um, only four of those received immunity. Um, Lawrence didn't appear on the stand for himself and none of his, his soldiers um, spoke in his defense. Uh, it took the jury of army officers just three hours to find him guilty of second degree murder, uh, making false statements and ordering his men to fire at Afghan civilians. And he was given a, uh, a 20 year sentence at, at Leavenworth for, uh, for his crimes. Now in between the time that he was sentenced and, and went to prison and the time of his, um, of his pardon, his lawyers, including the one that you were mentioning, Tom, uh, John um, Maher, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but anyways, um, they tried a whole bunch of different different avenues in trying to get the military to appeal his case to give them any possibility of having somebody else look at it. Um, they one one appeal they specifically came back about what we already discussed about that because Lawrence did not know at the time that they were in again suspected, not known, but suspected um, bomb makers that, that that part of it was, uh, was irrelevant. But then we move over to 2019 and you have the, the conservative media buildup around him when President Trump was elected. They actually, President Trump and Sean Hannity spoke about Lawrence in their first interview together um, shortly after Trump coming into the, uh, coming into the White House. And it was this biometric line of thinking is what they use. They told people that these men, they weren't not, they were suspected that they were actually in fact Taliban bomb makers and that the military was railroading Lawrence for having killed them. And that's not at all what happened, but that was very much the, the mainstream story, at least on, on conservative media. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've, I've used for notes today came from other places. The New York Times and the Washington Post have both done pretty fair and balanced um, exposés on what Lawrence did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, conservative media definitely took this to be a um, something that they could get a win on and something that they could tag back to President Obama, given that he was prosecuted under the Obama administration, although Obama had nothing to do with it. It was entirely under the military. Um, so before we go any further, I want to say the names of these guys and some of the things that they went through and what they, you know, where, what, uh, 
what ultimately ended up happening to some of them. We have uh, Jared Roll, a standout soldier in Afghanistan. Roll struggle, struggled after the war with anger, depression, and PTSD. He died in an accidental shooting. Um, Joe Fieldheim, he, uh, Fieldheim saved his, his fellow soldier, Haynes, saved his life after he was shot in the neck and unable to breathe. He struggled with PTSD upon his return home. Dave Zettel, he was uh, one of the guys in the guard tower when Lawrence ordered soldiers to shoot near unarmed civilians. He ended up returning to college and becoming an army officer. Keith Ayers, who was the platoon sergeant, the, the person that would have been mentoring Lawrence had he remained in there. Um, he actually testified against Lawrence at the, the trial. Um, Matthew Haynes, um, he ended up getting shot in the neck and paralyzed in Afghanistan nine days before Lawrence, uh, the Lawrence shooting. Uh, Mark Kerner, he was wounded in an IED blast a few weeks before the killings. He died of cancer in 2015. There's Samuel Wally, who lost his leg and arm when he stepped in I IED, also a few weeks before Lawrence took over. James O. Twist, uh, Twist risked his life to save Samuel Wally. He was a Michigan State Trooper and father of three when he died by suicide. Um, Mike McGinnis, um, who clashed with Lawrence and sought to sh did what he could to shield his soldiers from the fallout of the war crimes. And Lucas Gray. Lucas Gray uh, witnessed the killing of the three Afghan men from inside the, the gun truck that we talked about that opened fire. Uh, the war crimes shattered his idealism. And that was a, a thing I got from the from the Washington Post. But I, I think it's really important that we acknowledge the the human toll in this situation. Like I mentioned earlier, we already have a horrific war. We already have soldiers that have suffered a great deal trying to fight in that war. And we have somebody who comes in and just upends everything. And, and it, it's also worth mentioning is that the military justice system is very much about blame wherever they can find it. Um, that sometimes, you, you know, the people that we would look at and ostensibly say they did the right thing, they still get investigated. They still get interrogated. They still maybe get fingerprinted. Will they actually get charged with a crime? It's, it's, it's hard to know. But the military justice system is very harsh that way in that it's more like guilty until proven innocent rather than innocent until proven guilty. Well, yeah, because it's about, it's about protecting the institution, protecting the image the reputation, yep. you know, all the bullshit like that we are fed to believe about why America, you know, that we need to be doing these things is shattered every single time this stuff happens. And they're, of course, going to do what everybody does. It's just like what's going on with the Derek Chauvin trial of like all the cops being like, oh, well, you know, we didn't tell them to do this or, you know, we have these trainings and stuff. And it's like, th that doesn't fucking matter. Like you... Uh, you are encouraging this behavior when you allow stuff like this to happen. And it's the same thing with the military. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters, helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Why I Am Anti War Podcast. Scott Spaulding, Kenneth Cordasco, Korgoth, and the Status Quo Podcast. 
Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. I mean, one of the things that came out of the Leavenworth documentary that I found very interesting is that at his uh, trial, court-martial, uh, his original defense lawyer, one of the criticisms his subsequent lawyer made was that his original lawyer was somehow deficient or ineffective, which, I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he wasn't that bad, um, is that the lawyer had never been out to the scene in Afghanistan. He'd never gone out to interview anyone, take any pictures, get a, the lay of the land, understand you know, the actual physical space in which all of this happened. And one of the reasons his lawyer didn't go is because by that point the area was no longer under American control, that things had devolved so badly <laughs> after this shooting that the Americans had basically given up that point, mm -hmm. had given up that base and, and said, we can't, you know, this is getting too violent, this is getting too chaotic, no one trusts us anymore, what a fucking surprise. And, <laughs> um, and they, you know, they basically pulled out of that particular bit of Afghanistan. And it's sort of, yeah, okay, that is a problem for Lawrence's defense, but I know you can't see me because we're not using cameras for this talk, but, you know, I'm playing the world's smallest violin for Clint Lawrence in that particular respect of this story, because it's like, well, if you hadn't done that, that wouldn't have happened. And so, you know, um, however, there is a dimension to this. It doesn't excuse in any way or mitigate what Lawrence did, but I do think there was a wider army fuck up here in as much as they took this guy who certainly an intelligent guy whenever i've seen him in interviews he doesn't come across like a dumbo at all does Lawrence, but he was an intelligent fairly ambitious guy he wanted you know this kind of posting this kind of uh, responsibility but they took a guy who was essentially spent as far as I know, all of his time in Afghanistan up until that point, working in intelligence and communications, not actually on the ground. And they dump him into a place that's pretty fractious. You know, there's been a fair amount of violence recently. Was, he wasn't prepared. He didn't have the relevant experience. There was also this issue about, you know, he's an outsider and it's always a bit difficult for an outsider. There is also the issue of him being gay. I don't know how much of that actually plays into the dynamics in those three days um i don't know if anyone there actually knew he was gay other people back where he was posted before knew but i'm not sure those guys knew so i'm not sure if it has any relevance to this at all um so i think there was a bit of a command screw up here that partly contributes to why this guy was put in a position that he clearly wasn't capable of dealing with and didn't have the right mindset for at all. And then, I mean, they end up prosecuting Lawrence. Fair enough. What he did was abominable and stupid and wrong. They did also charge some of the other members of that platoon over an incident that happened on the same patrol. That, as far as I can tell, was a by-the-books shooting. It was all according to the rules of engagement. It involved, you know, they identified someone who had a communications radio. And at that point in Afghanistan, that meant they were a legitimate enemy target and therefore could be killed. And that they went all through the entire process of making sure, you know, get the big binoculars out, make sure this guy's got a fucking radio and he's not, you know, it's not something else. Yeah. Um, and, then they, and then they killed him and I think another guy who also had a radio. And they ended up charging some of these guys with saying that was a murder too, and that was all part of this same engagement. But then they offered some of those guys immunity if they testified against Lorenz. But these guys had already testified against Lorenz. They'd already given their sworn statements saying what had happened. Wow. So that whole thing seems a bit like the command were manipulating this situation in some way, partly to make sure they could nail the rants because they wanted to make him the kind of, you know, the poster boy for war criminals. And, you know, yep. look, we're dealing with our own, we're dealing with this problem, even though they actually weren't. Um, 
but also I think to avoid any splashback on the command itself because I think they did screw up here they put the wrong guy in there and that doesn't make them responsible for what he did but that question should at least have been asked in this criminal investigation and in this process but of course it's that very command who are making the decision as to who gets investigated and charged here and where this process ends up so there's no real accountability <laughs> for them there's no. accountability for the guys on the ground which in Lawrence's case is perfectly fair but in the other guy's case as far as I can tell they didn't do anything desperately wrong so yeah I'm just saying there is a bigger picture here around why it was that they did prosecute this case not that Lawrence was innocent, not that he was fitted up particularly, <clears throat> um, but more that, <clears throat> excuse me, more that they wanted something like this because the situation in Afghanistan and the shift to the whole surge counterinsurgency process and, and policy in Afghanistan, they needed something to sell this. There were, there were quite a lot of civilian deaths. There were quite a lot of, I assume, civilian murders going mm -hmm. on and they needed to set a, a standard both in terms of PR to the Afghans to convince them you know we're doing this properly you can trust us but also I think as a kind of signal to the the guys in the ranks and the women in the ranks as well that you know if you do start keep on to kind of doing what we've already been doing for the last 10-12 years something like this might end up happening you might end up on trial as well so there was a political dimension and a PR dimension to this, all of, you know, how the whole court martial and, and the, the CID investigation and all of that played out. None of that, to be clear, makes me think Lawrence was at all innocent. He's still fucking guilty as far as I'm concerned. I'm just no, saying yeah. there is a bigger context here. You're absolutely right. And like, and not just the service people, but also the American people, like to show that, we're taking this stuff seriously, even though every fucking day people shoot somebody and like it doesn't go anywhere because nobody reports. It. And it's it's like the only like the only time they bring the stuff up is when there's like an an overwhelming amount of evidence and uh, enough people come forward to be like, hey, this was fucked up and we need to do something about it. But otherwise, it's just another fucking Tuesday or whatever. The um, first thing. Most of the guys um, in their in their interviews mentioned that they had no idea that Lawrence was gay, that it was, and and for most of them that it wouldn't have been a thing, you know, it, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't they wouldn't have cared otherwise. But yeah, they you know, he wasn't there long enough for them to know any anything like that. The other thing to mention, and this goes right in line with what you're what you're highlighting here, Tom, is that about three months. Maybe it was a little bit longer. Let's say just to round, round up a little, uh, in the last year, close to where their, their camp was, um, Robert Bales killed all of those Afghan civilians. And, you know, mm -hmm. that, that considered to be one of the worst war crimes in, in this particular era in terms of, of how callous and horrifying it was. And so you, you can absolutely bet money, Tom, that the chain of command uh, you know, from Lawrence's unit all the way up through places like CENTCOM and the, you know, the theater commands, the bigger places that are just full of uh, people with stars on their shoulders, that they wanted to make sure that this, they set an example with him. But I don't think it had so much to do with the killing. I think that a big part of how quickly he was prosecuted and stuff had to do with trying to get his troops to lie. Um, the army is a little, quite a bit more forgiving if somebody's just like, Hey, mea culpa, I did this thing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to say that he shouldn't have been punished. I believe he should have been, I think the 20 years that he got was, wasn't even enough, but, mm. um, but there's absolutely command influence in, in this, in this way with, uh, going with that between the, the time that it happened within the Afghan war, the fact that Bales had committed those horrific crimes, um, and then you have him trying, uh, Lawrence trying to get his troops to, to lie, to lie to other leaders, to lie to um, anyone who would ask. And that really presents a lot of questions about Lawrence's, to me, who his earlier time in the army, that his time as an MP, that somebody told him if the paperwork 
was right, then nobody would care that he just had to articulate his position a certain way. And as long as nobody called him a liar, there no, nobody else would have been the wiser. Um, I believe he brought that that inclination from the MP Corps, and I'd like to know a lot more about it. Um, mm. But it's uh, but no, it, it absolutely the the command influence in this needs to be looked at and and understood. Um, so, um, did you guys have anything else? I had, I was uh, I've got just a little bit of my script left here, and then. Uh, we can kind of round things out if there's uh, but there's anything else you guys want to mention at this point just one thing oh kagan go ahead no no, no go ahead sir. Uh, just one thing from what you were saying before about Laurent seeing all the locals as the enemy um and that he went in there with this a, a mentality that actually reminds me quite a lot of of marcus luttrell uh, in his book lone survivor which is Honestly, one of the most racist books I've ever read. Um, <laughs> Was it that? Is that the same kind of stuff? The same kind of that? Fucking hate the enemy. They're not worth it. They're not nothing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, more more aggressive than anything that I've actually heard Laurent say himself in interviews. But similar sorts of things to what you know the people around him reported him as saying. And I guess we have to take their their accounts as accurate. Um, at least in the absence of any proof otherwise, and sure. let's face it, it all adds up, um, is that w one of the things he says in the interviews in the documentary, um, and by the way, this documentary must have been DOD supported to some extent, because they actually got inside Leavenworth to go and interview him, and they filmed in, you know, at Fort Bragg and other places. So I'm not quite sure what was in it for the DOD to allow such close scrutiny to this maybe it partly was motivated by they actually kind of like this narrative about oh we can't be prosecuting the troops for just doing their jobs um there certainly is a pr angle in it for them i guess there though that's complicated i won't get into all that basically <laughs> it's that uh afterwards uh, on that day after the shooting when they continued their patrol through the village um he said he saw this uh, this woman and these children crying over the, you know, over the shootings, over the dead bodies. And it was at that point he started to feel a kind of sense of panic and that he hadn't thought up until that point that the Taliban would have wives and children and families. Hmm. And it's sort of, well, firstly, you haven't established that these guys were in the fucking Taliban in the first place. Exactly. Once, <laughs> you know, but even if they were, it had never occurred to you that they had families what kind of i mean either this guy's a complete idiot which he isn't he doesn't come across as an idiot or that's a little revelation however polite and however sort of sensitively expressed that deep down this guy harbored some fairly sick prejudices and a pretty blinkered messed up view of afghan people yeah and i think that has to be considered in you know trying to understand exactly why he did this because that's another problem is that even after having read about a lot of this and having watched quite a lot of different you know newscasts and documentaries and what have you i'm still not 100 percent sure why on earth laurent did what he did um and i certainly think that you know that kind of prejudice that kind of bigoted view has to be part of the tapestry here and it's not yeah. something that to my knowledge has been drawn out that much well, that goes into the whole conversation of unconscious bias, which I don't think a lot of institutions, especially the military, are ready to have, to like really understand why somebody makes a decision like that. It's not because, well, I mean, it may, like you said, it may be that he wasn't thinking and he just did that. But like more often than not, there are those unconscious biases that creep in and make us like make a decision really quickly it's the same thing with police shootings like why do they do that oh because they are trained to believe that like to look at things as threats first and foremost and then you know to like to dehumanize and even if you're not wanting to like that's a part of it but like clearly that was that was a part of his thinking is that he did not see them as people as regular people like him or the people he was with and so he was willing to kill them for that and yeah, like that, no, no institution, especially the ones that are responsible for the taking of lives 
are really willing to have that test. Mm, mm. I think he 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 seemed to wholeheartedly believe that the guys on the ground with him were just going to back him up. Yeah. What whatever story he came up with, whatever he wanted it to be articulated he even mentioned to them you know i i uh i don't have the quote in front of me but i i know i know how to write this up so we don't get in trouble that was one, one thing that he said to one of the soldiers um which again where did he learn how to do that and yeah. why was he so casually okay with that <laughs> um and and we also have to include that you know he in his time working in the operations center that he was certainly privy to all of the death and the destruction that was affecting other troops within within his squadron um and so i think that he internalized a lot of that turmoil and said i'm going to i'm going to pay it back not understanding that these guys weren't in a place to do anything like that you know i i I guess if (laughs) if i were more of an asshole like lawrence i would want to test the waters a little bit to to see you know are are, are these guys going to be the same because again he's he's an infantry officer now he's not in the mp corps anymore and the branches can be fairly different on how they do things mps you have to you know you get caught lying it's horrible i mean it, and and i think it should be i don't think people should should get unpunished but in terms of going after their own that that they hold that up as a as a medal to say how how much that they pursue troops that have integrity and honor and, and all, all those good things that you want to have said about your soldiers i mean one other thing that I, i'd also just like to to bring up is that he has also said repeatedly that when he got when he was first posted as this uh, platoon leader um that he saw his mission when he got there as pro- protecting the guys next to him and it's like okay that is part of it you're the leader of this group of guys. Mm-hmm. You are ultimately somewhat responsible for their safety. But that wasn't like the actual mission that they were sent on. They were sent on a counterinsurgency mission, which isn't about seeing everything outside of you as a threat and solely trying to protect you and the guys next to you. That's, yeah. the, that's a very different sort of mentality. That isn't, you know, you can't marry those two things together. I mean, okay, the whole counterinsurgency thing was prosecuted in a really dumbass way and it was never well conceived to begin with. Yeah. But none, nonetheless, it's a better approach than just, I'm terrified of these people out there, so we're going to form a wall and shoot at them, right. which essentially seems to have been the mentality that he went in there with. But even though he couched it in those terms, again, it reveals a certain, like, much deeper, darker bias within that. He does this a lot, does Lorenz. He expresses himself very politely. He's a very kind of congenial guy. Um, But deep down, I think he went in there, like you say, uh, Henry, he he must have been seeing all of these reports of deaths and injuries. and, And when you're seeing, like, all of that come together, you're not just seeing a bit here and a bit there that's relevant to your area. You get an impression of, you know, just how dangerous it can be out there. Uh, and perhaps a warped impression, because you're kind of seeing this all the time rather than understanding, okay, this is an entire country that we're talking about. So, um, yeah, I think he went in there with a paranoid, neurotic mentality, a fairly racist mentality. And the guys next to him, who had most of whom had been there for quite a while and had managed to build up some degree of trust and some kind of bond with the locals, they didn't have that mentality at all. Um, or not very many of them did, it doesn't seem. I think that's partly why he didn't gel with them at all properly, and also why, you know, he had this, oh, I'm protecting the guys next to me, so they're going to protect me no matter what I do. Yeah. So He miscalculated (laughs) that badly, because a lot of those guys, even as he was giving the order to shoot, were shouting on the radio, or they say they were shouting, they were certainly saying on the radio, no, don't shoot. They were trying to, you know, counter this. They were trying to push back against this. So even in that moment, some of them were resisting. And then afterwards, most of them, their immediate reaction was, this is screwed up. This is wrong. We can't be doing this. And at the first opportunity they got, or more or less first opportunity they got, they, they said so. 
um, despite Lawrence's attempts to get them to spin it or lie or whatever the hell else he was trying to manipulate them into doing. So I think while those guys, you know, there are criticisms that could be made of some of what they did on those days um, and whether or not they could have identified this problem earlier or what have you. Ultimately, they did the right thing. And a lot of credit has to go to them for that because it can't be that easy when you're in a war zone, for heaven's sake, to stand up and say what this guy ordered and what this guy did was fundamentally wrong and illegal and we need to do something about this, particularly when you know there's a reasonable chance of what actually happened is what's going to happen, is that your unit is going to be split up, your, you know, these guys that you've spent months bonding with and working alongside and fighting alongside and what have you are going to be sent off to the other end of the country or sent back to the States. And, you know, the whole thing's going to kind of fall apart. And that also was wrong. That was also a bad decision by the army in the wake of this was to say, oh, right, well, this, you know, there must be something wrong in this unit. Yeah. <laughs> there was something that went horribly wrong for three days, largely because of Clint Lawrence, um, and also some command decisions that put him there in the first place. That's what really went wrong here. That unit itself actually, you know, they interviewed at least a dozen of these guys for the documentary, and they all come across as very decent people. Um, they don't come across as people who ratted someone out because they could. They don't come across as people who were opportunistic or exploitative. I think they were driven by a sense of doing the right thing and they did the right thing. And that's always something that impresses me, especially, as I say, when it's people in a screwed up institution in a war zone. Yeah. So a lot of respect for to them for that. The... Uh... <clears throat> One thing I wanted to highlight in discussing this is the conservative media response that propelled uh, the idea of the pardon for Lawrence to the attention of um, of President Trump. You know, you have on on the one hand, you have the 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 story of that that this young lieutenant went into war and was was betrayed by uh, betrayed by his soldiers that they did not back him up when they when they should have. Um, and that and that story that that lane of understanding has been really the only one that conservative media has championed. Um, the the list of names that I read earlier and the the various injuries and deaths that they have had to deal with that didn't seem to factor into Sean Hannity's or Peter Hexes calculus in, in trying to get the president to do this. It was about the, um, you know, the right leaning uh, mentality of, of hating the enemy, hating the other people that were fighting, which is, we, we understand it, but it's not the only side of the story. Um, and that places like Fox News didn't cover all these suicides, all these injuries that these guys dealt with, didn't deal with the fallout of what happened to the mission in that area of Afghanistan partly or entirely related to what Lawrence chose to do. They, you know, they, they chose to just ignore it. And those, those soldiers, those guys that you just mentioned, Tom, you know, they feel incredibly marginalized now as a result of that, that the, mm. the, media space their media space because many of them are conservatives and and guys talked about listening to listening to hannity or rush limbaugh and they have to hear those same media types call them traitors call them that they they betrayed their lieutenant and did not back him and that adds a whole additional layer to a soldier's trauma you know on top of any any ptsd on top of any moral injury they may have for situations that happened when Lawrence wasn't there he didn't even take the time to get to know them to understand that he just showed up did what he thought he needed to do and the fallout hasn't been his problem he's mentioned that he can't even remember very many if any of their names oh. and, and and these are supposed to be people that he was going there to lead to care for to to try to understand and to to do a better job to do a, a good job as a leader and it, it entirely well, and, and to win. learn from yep yep yes that that's the thing that he most fundamentally didn't do here and so no wonder he can't remember them 
they didn't. They, it seems they didn't mean much more to him than the Afghans did. Nope. Well, and that's that's the main problem I think that a lot of people have with like the the junior officers is that like when you can't just come into a situation and act all cocky when you don't know shit about the situation or the people or anything and like yeah i mean if that doesn't describe the american experience in the middle east is like it's just to a t like we go in there and we feel like we have a a mission to do something but we didn't try to learn anything about the people about the culture about what the region was like and how our you know how the way that we're in entering or what we're doing is going to impact people it was just we're here to do what we're going to do and like damn the consequences and as you said henry too about like them not bringing up the other people and like their issues and the stuff the fallout from this it's because you know of course fox news and then they don't want people to think about that because that makes that would make people have to think about the broader implications of us being there and like what what are we doing there and how is it affecting our our soldiers and then how is it affecting everybody else and they yeah of course they're not going to bring that up because that goes against their whole being rah rah pro military bullshit yeah, there, there is a great sequence in the documentary where they're playing some of these clips from Hannity and from Fox in their, you know, terrible coverage of this. And the guys who were actually there are sitting there going, yep, that didn't happen. Nope, that's wrong. Nope, yep. never happened. <laughs> and, it is, and it is things like they say that the, uh, the previous lieutenant uh, had been killed. He wasn't. He was badly injured. He wasn't killed. That's simply not true. So... <laughs> You know, they just they stick that in there to make it sound like, oh, he was dropped into this lethal war zone. What else yeah. could he have done? Kind of thing. Oh. And it's like that oh. wasn't actually the reality he found on the ground. And like I keep saying, if he'd actually listened to the guys who were there and learnt from them, because they'd actually been dealing with this situation right in front of them for, you know, months, this probably never would have happened. And yep. so for Fox to kind of um generate this myth and particularly Hannity himself who is you know a vile prick if ever there was one um for them to generate this myth to try and excuse the very mentality that Lawrence went in there with which caused this that that I found quite disturbing because it's like he went in there unwilling to learn anything Fox approached this story unwilling to learn anything (laughs) yep that's kind of their Uh, mo (laughs) Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, big, big surprise, but but you know what I mean? It's just repeating the same mistake, repeating the same screwed up mentality that caused this in the first place. Well, and And, then Alan West's uh, uh, email, it was the same thing. It was like, oh, this innocent soldier who is just doing his job. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, no. No, you, you, you end up seeing how that, that, those media types is just it's driven much more by personality and that includes with Lawrence you know they want to make it seem you know that he was the hero that he was the real victim that that um they, like you you're saying that there was there was no alternative there was no choice for him to go in but but to go in and do exactly what he did and and why think about it why even consider other possibilities they're not you know like I said we we don't we don't want to learn we don't want to learn additional possibilities because we consider it to be um, that, you know, that light and dark. We don't, you know, it, 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 that's all that the question is. There isn't, isn't bigger ones. So um, to close out for today, I have a, a quote from an article um, from Just Security about Lawrence. Um, and it just in discussing some of the, the political implications of, of the choices we've been discussing here today. Quote, research has shown that Americans increasingly tend to view the military like the Supreme Court, awarding approval or disapproval of the institution itself based on whether its decisions align with their personal opinions. The similarity does not bode well for the future, a a hypothetical future in which Senate confirmations of senior military personnel are handled in the same hyper-politicized way as Supreme Court hearings, for example should chill every American to the bone. Such a development would devastate our military's ability to act as an objective 
a political American foreign policy instrument. Ah, that sentence sucks. <laughs> a political um, my ass. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'll get to that in a minute. I got I got to say the bullshit, then I can dissect the bullshit. Um, <laughs> Well, elected leaders should be the first line of defense against military polit politicization. Many instead worsen the problem by improperly invoking, quote unquote, national security and the military to legitimize policy preferences that they otherwise could not implement. Retired military leaders have also exacerbated this issue by leveraging their credibility to weigh in on political topics and make partisan endorsements. These retirees, as many scholars have noted, are playing with fire. But despite occasional consternation about military politi politicization by scholars and opinion writers, there is little reason to expect a mass awakening on this issue in Congress or general society. Political candidates' stances on maintaining civil military norms will not likely become the most salient issue in upcoming campaigns. As a result, and unfortunately, men and women joining the armed forces today must mentally and morally prepare themselves to spend their careers having their service viewed through a partisan lens in a way that their recent predecessors have not. So the military is absolutely a political institution. And, and I, I, don't, I don't want to second guess that idea in, in the least. Um, but I don't think I don't think that uh, I think we need to understand that the military tries to pretend that it's apolitical and that lots of its members and other people in America believe it's apolitical, despite the obvious reality that it is not in any way, shape or form apolitical. Uh, Clausewitz said that the war is the continuation of politics by other means. Mm -hmm. The military, despite all noise to the contrary, is an inherently political institution. Its personnel, its missions, and its effects on our world all have deep political implications. We can't afford to pretend that troops can or should be above the fray. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www. Dot fortress on a hill dot com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll and see you next time. Listen to my song. 